absolutely. And it's funny because you hear that expression a lot, like that, you know, in police interviews, they just let people talk and talk and talk because when they talk so much, they end up giving themselves away. So, when was her red pill moment again? On Ruben, she said she pieced it all together instantly. Now, I'll believe that she woke up immediately about the mainstream media, because that's a nonpartisan issue. Left, right, liberals, conservatives, people of all ideologies hate the mainstream media. But let's take the examples of Lacey Green and James Damore. Both of them, you could say, were also force-fed the red pill, as Candace phrases it. They both got caught in a media firestorm coming from the people they thought would be on their side or were their friends. But did Lacey totally change her views and become a different person? No. I imagine she shifted some because of dating Chris Reagan, but as far as I can tell, she's still left-leaning liberal. And James Damore was already watching people like Dave Rubin and Jordan Peterson, but even after the progressive company that he loved threw him out in the garbage and the mainstream media dragged him through the dirt, he didn't say, oh, I'm instantly conservative now in everything I believe. She says, direct quote on Rubin. Instantly. I mean, I, I was, I, I became a conservative overnight, you know? She says the media attacks on Trump resonated with her. But Trump's not a conservative. He's not supported by a ton of conservatives. She says she thinks she was never really a liberal and was really apolitical, but feels she was always truly a conservative. How fucking convenient that is. She says she didn't really know what being a liberal meant or being a conservative meant. Hmm. Does she know now? She says she's pretty rational and fact-based and will always value economics above, like, social issues. What type of economics does she subscribe to? Keynesian? Austrian school? Can she explain what marginal utility is? The economic debates surrounding the minimum wage? Anything to do with economics? She also says she doesn't have a position on abortion just yet. Dude, it's literally been almost a year and a half during this Rubin interview since her Kickstarter blew up. And she's now this conservative darling, but she hasn't figured out her view on abortion, one of the most fundamental issues for modern Republicans, for modern conservatives. What happened to the conservative overnight thing? If you ask me, she's just a middle school girl who got rejected by one click and switched to a different one. Honestly. Let's talk about her conservatism. Seriously, for someone who woke up and became an overnight conservative back in April 2016, now that it's November 2017 and she only launched her channel three months ago, what was she doing with all that time? She said she took a year off and doesn't reference having a job. She also refers to herself as re-entering the market as a more informed person, which is pretty telling language if you ask me. But she doesn't mention, was she reading books? Was she watching people on YouTube? Reading articles? What was she doing? She said she was intelligent enough to know instantly that Zoe Quinn wasn't a victim and to figure out everything that was going on. But she hasn't talked at all about her intellectual journey. Cassie J took a few years to leave feminism, and it took me a few years to leave feminism, SJW, thinking, intersectionality, all of that. And to learn enough about economics, history, politics, ethics, and philosophy to become a classical liberal. But I'm supposed to believe Candace just woke up one day and was like, Oh my god, Zoe Quinn called me, and the media is a lie, and now I also understand the minimum wage was a tactic employed by the original progressives at the turn of the 20th century to force immigrants, blacks, women, and disabled people out of the workforce. No, I'm sorry, but no. It's fine if she wants to fight the culture wars like Milo, but Milo actually knows his shit. She really has nothing original to say. And I know that she on Head's channel got big with only a few videos, but she wasn't making the rounds on all these political channels like she was a political commentator. Red Pill Black is not a political commentator. She has no principles. I guarantee if you asked her, she couldn't explain to you what conservatism is or what free speech is and why it's critical. In any of these interviews that I've listened to, she's never talked of anything about her actual beliefs beyond saying she's conservative. The Rubin Report interview was the closest, but it presents a lot of questions. I've listened to her on Paul Joseph Watson, Alex Jones, Rubin, Fox News, Stefan Molyneux, and everything she says just sounds like talking points. I've been listening carefully for something that sounds like her being genuine and not like she's in a job interview or trying to sell you something or sell herself. But her story is so slick, really slick. And she's literally not saying anything that I haven't heard people in the conservative space say in the past. It's a little disconcerting, actually. 
I've watched her facial expressions too, and she really reminds me of myself when I'm in a job interview trying to anticipate what people are going to say, or when I'm in a conversation with someone I don't know or like but have to get along with, and I'm waiting to hear what they say and then just agree. She disagrees with everyone who interviews her. Absolutely. 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 Like when she was on Alex Jones and she just agreed with everything, even though I was sitting here like, do you understand half of what he's talking about? I mean, part of this is the fault of the interviewers. Someone pointed out in the comments on Stefan's video that these guys don't actually ask her any questions about her beliefs or challenge her on these things. She says a lot of things like, this is why I always say X. And I, that's why I say it's a Democrat plantation of thoughts. We are our mules that just carry them up, you know, into the election every four years. She refers to the Democratic plantation. You know, this is why I call it the Democratic plantation of ideas. I'm sorry, that's not your idea. Why don't you go talk to a bunch of black conservatives, even black conservative YouTubers? You didn't come up with that. Sorry. She also went on Fox and said, And I say all the time, facts don't care about your feelings. And she doesn't credit Ben Shapiro, which is either really audacious or really sloppy of her. And in her interview on InfoWars War Room, she spends a chunk of time shitting on feminism. Don't get me wrong. I'm not only a former feminist, I'm now an anti-feminist. But she says, And I am like the most vocal anti-feminist. I'm sure it was just sloppy language, but I couldn't help but think, does Karen Strawn know you're making that claim? And another thing I noticed is that all she does is laugh about everything. Go back and watch her interview. She's smiling through the whole thing. She's laughing the whole time, like doing that kind of SJW thing where they kind of are like elbow, elbow, like nudge, nudge. Feminists, am I right? Liberals, am I right? I don't know when they're going to realize that Trump won. You know, like I mean, all of the tears, all of the crying. It must be true. She wrote Harry Potter, so therefore it must be true. Pussy hat. The pussy hat. Come on. Most of them aren't even good actors or singers, and now they're inserting their noses in politics. Like, she's just preaching and pandering. Nothing she says is original. And she just, like, is laughing this whole thing and nodding and, like, right. you know. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> they, know? They, they, they feel... It's like, people joke and they say liberalism is a mental disorder, but it's not a joke. Like, it yeah. really is yeah. a mental disorder. They can't see the world for what it is. They can't have a conversation outside of their feelings and, you know, and they feel attacked, literally attacked by facts. Yeah, never heard that one before. Uh, she does this in every interview, but I think I noticed it the most in the War Room interview, if you want to go check that one out. Also important to keep in mind, hating SJWs on the left doesn't make someone conservative. Candace also said on InfoWars that she wanted to be inclusive about who gets to be a conservative based on what they believe. I'm sorry, but being a conservative means something, just as being a liberal means something. People think that you can just like use the word and completely change its meaning. And She's also really vague in all of these interviews. She doesn't relate any of the details of the experiences she says she had dealing with family members who haven't been accepting of her changed beliefs. She went on Andrew Clavin and said that, yeah, she had lost friends because of this, but she doesn't express an ounce of emotion or regret about it, relates no personal anecdotes, which is very strange to me. Because I have literally lost friends who were dear to me because I'm no longer a feminist, because I'm no longer progressive, and it was deeply painful. She essentially said that you can't be friends with liberals once you become a conservative because they just care about feelings, not facts, and you can't talk to them. I was a conservative thinker. I believe I value hard work. Um, I value logic. And if you value those two things, you actually you can't have liberal friends. Which is bullshit because I'm right leaning and manage to be friends with non right leaning people. That's pretty much all of my friends. Pretty much all my friends are progressives and all the women that I'm friends with are feminists. And my boyfriend is an anarcho capitalist libertarian and none of his friends share those beliefs. So to me, she just sounds like a shitty fucking friend or she's full of shit. As I mentioned previously, she gave a TEDx talk on digital activism. Um, this was on June 4th, 2016. This was almost two months after the shit went down where she said she woke up a conservative. You watch this TEDx talk and tell me if this is a conservative. What digital activism feels like on the other side is a lot of pain. It can be half a decade of an eating disorder. It can be suicidal thoughts. It can be just an individual that isn't equipped to deal with our criticisms. I just don't think so. So, at risk of sounding like another jaded millennial. Now, I love a good conspiracy theory. I go down rabbit holes for days. 
It's certainly possible that she's an SJW trying to infiltrate the conservative movement. However, I will posit some theories here I think are more plausible. Number one, she's an opportunist and a shrewd businesswoman. Now, she doesn't come off as that much of a shrewd businesswoman based on the fact that she thought social autopsy was a good idea in the first place and the way she handled the fallout. However, I think it's likely that after all the fallout from it, she realized she couldn't do anything with it anymore. Maybe no one wanted to work with her anymore. That is, the anti-bullying organization she referenced being connected to dropped her. She took some time off, maybe had some savings from her years in the finance industry, since she doesn't reference working at all between social autopsy and starting her YouTube channel. And maybe after being alerted to Gamergate, she fell down her own rabbit hole and discovered conservative YouTube and saw the opportunity for a young black woman to fill a niche, a very lucrative niche with the existence of Patreon now. So she watched everything and memorized all the conservative talking points in preparation. Or maybe her boyfriend at the time, I'm not sure if they're still together, who she said was a far-right conservative, pointed out to her how she could use identity politics to her benefit. As I mentioned, she told the Ralph Retort that social autopsy wasn't over, and that she was working with a computer forensics company and was interested in now building the kind of things Zoe Quinn was afraid of. Number two. She's an SJW who got really excited about conservatism without fully understanding it and without shedding her SJW tactics. So now she's just using SJW tactics, such as blocking people who are asking her questions she doesn't like on Twitter, refusing to talk to anyone who she knows is skeptical of her, thanking all the people supporting her, like Paul Joseph Watson and Dave Rubin, in this really obnoxious way, saying, no wonder they are leaders, making sure everyone knows that the truly great people are supporting her and everyone else are just haters, basically shitting on everyone who's questioned her, however mild, saying this is a coordinated attack and that it was funded, saying that people are trying to tear her down because she's a black conservative. But she hates identity politics and the victim mentality, guys. I mean, this is textbook SJW shit. So maybe she does believe some of the conservative talking points she's rattling off, but if so, she's just brought her SJW mindset to the conservative side. She also uses the word we in this very progressive, collectivist way. She says on Patreon, in response to all these people questioning her, we knew it would be an uphill battle. And again on Twitter, she says, we knew the journey for black conservatives would be uphill. That one really cracked me up. Who is we, dude? You've been here for five minutes. Like, sit the fuck down. Good Lord. If I believed in God, I would pray for him to bring Thomas Sowell out of retirement and fucking school this bitch. That would just fucking make my life. I can almost guarantee you she does not know who Thomas Sowell is. Unless she's been furiously studying right now, since she knows everyone's catching on to her bullshit. Number three. She's a sociopath. I mean, if you listen to her in the interviews, you hear her talk about, oh, I'm so calm and rational and I don't really understand emotions. And if you look through a bunch of the posts that she wrote on Degree 180, the way she writes, she literally talks about, you know, never crying about breakups, about when she started dating an older guy that, you know, you just, you know, you can't really get along with your friends anymore. Their relationship issues just like seem like level one stuff that's just silly. And just like the way she talks and also, you know, her saying in one of those articles that she, you know, realized that she's going to, you know, she's a star. She's going to be a star. And uh, looks like she's achieved that dream, guys. Number four. She's still traumatized from a bullying incident and her eating disorder, and she's looking for validation and approval. And she wasn't going to get it from the left after Zoe Quinn and Randy Harper came out against her. So she had to pivot. Number five. Okay, I have to give one conspiracy theory. So she's had this YouTube channel since September 21st, 2015, but she only started posting videos three months ago. And, you know, the channel's called Red Pill Black. It's possible she had the channel before and change the name on the google account associated with it so it would say red pill black but that seems really weird when i made this channel i just made an email address for it and launched it separate from my personal youtube account that i've been using for years why reuse an old youtube account for this endeavor so what if this is really a huge con and she's in league with zoe quinn and the whole thing was fake or she already knew about Gamergate the whole time, and she used Zoe Quinn to signal boost her project because she could play herself off as the victim of evil feminists. All right, I'm taking off the tinfoil hat. I don't have evidence for that, but there's enough here that I can certainly see why people are suspicious. If you look at these tweets, I'm sorry, but this is classic SJW shit. 
it's classic deflection it's playing the victim it's painting other people as haters and enemies for asking legitimate questions and refusing to take personal responsibility to own up to not only the fact that the site was not just a terrible idea, but a dangerous one, as evidenced by all the people in the Kiwi Farms thread who were able to take down all the data from the site, which was very much not just a splash page. She has not explained where all the data is now. I watched some Black Eye stream with Andy Worski, as I said, and Andy said that someone in tech was able to show him that the back end is still up. Now, he didn't show evidence... But that's very much a legitimate possibility. Taking down the front end of the website is not the same as killing the actual site, and the public would be none the wiser. Computing Forever pointed this out in a tweet, and I was right there with him in that concern. But because the front end is down, most people just want to move on because they think there's no more potential threat. In her TEDx talk, she says, I was also avoiding the problems from my past. And those problems retrospectively could have been solved if somebody had just said sorry and taking responsibility for what happened. Well said, Candace. So she still has a ton of support for now. She has 146,822 subscribers on YouTube as of the time I'm scripting this. That's about a thousand less from when I looked earlier this week. And she had 995 patrons earlier this week, but now as a time of scripting, she has 1,015 patrons. I'll be interested to see how this plays out. She's been tweeting about how she's giving talks to college students, which I'd really like to see a taping of, since she's been able to skyrocket herself to the kind of fame and relevance that's allowed her to give such talks in just a few short months, even though she gives all the appearance of being a cyborg program with anti-SJW conservative talking points. She could certainly arrange for them to be filmed the way that Ben Shapiro and Milo do. She says specifically that she wants to talk to liberals, not conservatives, so I'm curious, you know, what she's saying to them. I also imagine she'll get a spot on Alex Jones. I also saw Candace tweeting about going on The Daily Wire, but it doesn't look like she'll be talking to Ben Shapiro. That would be amazing because I know that Ben would sniff this girl out in two seconds for the fake conservative that she is. Please, I'm not sure there's a God, but if there is, let Ben Shapiro come out publicly against this chick because then a lot more people would really start to question her story. And it would be a great addition to the Ben Shapiro Thug Life collection. Other than that, there's not much to be done, especially not by me as I'm a nothing channel. I just hope people see all the videos that have been made about her and start to do their own review of the evidence. If she decides to get legit and actually study economics and politics and history and philosophy and can actually make arguments, that would certainly be something. But honestly, at this point, she's been so disingenuous and let her lies get so big, there's nothing she could do to win over my trust. I hope I laid everything out as clearly as possible. There's a lot to go through as I went pretty far down this rabbit hole. And I didn't even put in everything that I found or wanted to talk about because I wanted to keep things to a reasonable length. If you have any questions or want any links I didn't include in the description, just email me or DM me on Twitter, comment below, whatever you want, and I'll try to respond as quickly as I can. The next content on my channel will be part one of a three-part series on the Milo Yiannopoulos book deal from an insider perspective in the publishing industry, so stay tuned.